So obviously I'm going to touch on the topic of uh, growth hacking. Uh, it's probably best to give a bit of a background about kind of who I am, why I'm speaking, um, and who Influencer are. So actually, it's probably best if I get my presentation now. So who are Influencer? Probably not as well known as uh, Deliveroo, um, but we are an influencer marketing platform, as the name suggests. Um, our kind of message is for creators, by creators. So our company was founded by Casper Lee and Ben Jeffries, with another one of our investors being Joe Sugg, who you might know of. He was on Strictly Come Dancing recently. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is kind of police or kind of iron out the industry, making sure that we kind of get away, and I'll talk about it in the presentation, but get away from a lot of those kind of Love Island celebrities that you see promoting products um, and actually start working with reputable brands. So some of the brands we work with are Uber Eats, Nokia, um, Pepsi, McDonald's, Apple, um, and quite a few agencies as well. So um, just a bit of background on me as well. So um, obviously, as I said, was in Cannes this morning. I have now realised the reason I'm actually speaking. It's because Ben, our CEO, is actually double booked and uh, is still in Cannes. So that required me to come back for this. So apologies if uh, anyone was looking for him. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to uh, do just as good a job. Um, so in terms of influencer marketing... Um, I think it gets rather a kind of negative connotation um, at the moment. And I think, you know, there's a kind of scepticism in the industry. I mean, a kind of point of this being is that I remember when I joined Influencer about six months ago, telling my dad that I was about to go and work for two guys, one of which who's 23, the other who's 25 and makes YouTube videos for a living. Um, as you can imagine, as an old school Scott, he was particularly sceptical. Um, and then, in fact, actually our that same 25 year old is Casper Lee um, who recently was actually in a supermarket um, was asked by an old lady what he did so um, he said obviously a bunch of things involving social media she uh, said well I actually want a more definitive answer than that so I make YouTube videos and help other people do the same thing she said that sounds fun but obviously wanted to know what his day job was and I think that really highlights kind of what people view about influencers and I think they think it's just people that put up pretty photos um, and, you know, simply get free stuff, which is, you know, in some senses what they do, but uh, certainly not the ones we work with. So it's probably best to define what an influencer is. Um, so an influencer is someone with a large, obviously that's relatively speaking, social following, which in almost every case you would only know about if you follow them. Um, and obviously, what is influencer marketing? Influencer marketing is a hybrid of old and new marketing, taking the idea of personal endorsement and placing this within a modern day campaign. Obviously, the main difference here is that the results of the campaign are focused on the collaborations between brands and influencers. And I think, obviously, one topic to kind of address, first of all, is that kind of celebrity versus influencer um, point that, you know, are celebrities influencers? And to put it bluntly, they're not. Um, which, I mean, a prime example of this is someone like Cristiano. So Cristiano's got 170 million followers. Um, obviously, that amount of followers comes with great power. Um, you know, he it does work with a lot of reputable brands. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not influenced by him. You know, certainly people like Cristiano, Tiger, and, you know, until recently, Roger Federer, certainly do influence you to buy things like Nike clothing. However, it's more of the brands like Herbal Life and Sixpad that he works with um, kind of go away from that kind of brand identity. Um, so for anyone that doesn't actually know what Sixpad is, um, I'm not sure whether you've ever seen a 2 to kind of 5 a.m. gym advert, basically where normal TV service doesn't resume until about 6 o'clock. So you'll see some very over-enthusiastic Americans doing some ridiculous exercises, sweating at an uncontrollable rate, showing transformations that obviously no one's ever been able to achieve. And this is a pretty similar product. So, and as you can see, he's got quite a lot of um, stick for it. But, you know, he's more than happy to promote it purely because he gets paid vast sums. Um, and this is really kind of what 
labels the industry as rather cowboy because you get someone like Cristiano who is promoting something like this. And, you know, he's obviously got a lot of young followers that believe that, you know, they can turn, you know, from being rather overweight to sitting at home, you know, drinking probably full fat cake, just putting this on for half an hour at night and suddenly going to turn into that, which is obviously not going to happen. Um, you know, he also works with Herbal Life as well, who are now there brand that's got quite a lot of skepticism in the industry you know they'll work with any old um influencer the kind of ones that are vegan one week and then promoting you know dairy products the next so there's just kind of no cohesion within their platform or in terms of their following and showing their followers what they're actually about what we're trying to do is work with creators um rather than influencers which i'll um i'll touch on so obviously another kind of example of poor influencer marketing um, is the fire festival so if anyone doesn't know what this is um, this is a fire festival started by billy mcfarland and jarul uh, which is obviously an interesting combo in itself um, however billy mcfarland is in jail so you can probably work out how uh, how well this went um, essentially what they did was they started this um, luxury a uh, music festival that was going to be in the Bahamas on Pablo Escobar's old island um, and soon turned into the kind of fire fraud that you'll see on the right-hand side. Um, but the point here is that they basically picked the top 10 supermodels in order to promote um, the festival, which had its purpose. Um, it obviously got a lot of buzz within the industry and got people buying tickets. But the problem with celebrities is that no one actually believes what they're promoting. They know that sim they're simply getting paid to do it. So, um, and as you can tell, it didn't go particularly well. Um, a kind of another example of kind of poor influence marketing. And I'm just trying to highlight the difference between celebrities. And I'm going to come on to influence in a minute. But this is the Australian cricket captain. Um, I mean, putting out a tweet about... Uh, well, this actually on his Instagram, but it was on his Twitter as well, um, showcasing what Vodafone can do. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that's really going to sell me into a new plan. Um, but this is what companies believe, purely because he does have um, a number of followers that you know he could be worthwhile using. Um, and what we've discovered, and because we're a data-driven platform, is that it's not all about numbers. So just because someone's got X million followers does not mean they're better than using someone with, say, 30,000 followers. If their engagement's right and they've actually got the right audience, you know, for him, in terms of his audience, you know, where are they going to be based? Probably not in the UK. Um, so who's going to be signing up for Vodafone? Not a lot of people, I'd imagine. So then you move on to what we would describe as influencers or creators. So Josh uh, is another 25-year-old male. Um, he has nearly a million followers on his um, YouTube and you know nearly 500 on his uh, Instagram. The kind of difference you'll find with Josh is that he is a creator. Um, so a number of his videos, so he will interview celebrities um, in order to produce content that his audience enjoy. So he's not all about selling. In order to build up that trust with your audience, you need to produce content that they enjoy almost, that they're going to keep on coming back and looking at what you're producing rather than simply just trying to sell every product that someone's paying you to do. You know, a lot of this Josh will have done off his own back and won't be getting paid to do. Um, but there's obviously other stunts that he does. So he recently worked with Uber where he drove around in a um, tank for a day uh, picking people up, uh, which has obviously got over nearly a million views. He also then hatched his own supermarket egg uh, which actually wasn't in collaboration with Sainsbury's. But, but that's what I mean. He's producing content because it's a full-time job. You know, kind of going back to that Casper point is that people don't understand that actually what they do is a full-time job. So, I mean, I didn't really appreciate it until I started working in the industry. But, 
Casper comes into our office. He's actually one of our investors. Um, and if you ask him what he's done this weekend, most of the time he's actually spent the full weekend editing a video. You know, it's not something that takes kind of 20 minutes that he kind of thinks off off the top of his head. It, you know, it's a full time job, and they actually, you know, they're trying to build meaningful, meaningful relationships with brands. And that, that's a kind of another reason he started the business as well, because he was getting so annoyed at how many people were simply just trying to pay him to promote a product because he had so many followers. What he wanted was to say authentic to himself so that in the long run he's going to have longevity there's so many people like the love island or towie stars that know they've got a shelf life of kind of two years so we'll quite happily promote any sort of product you know from slimming pills to teeth whitening because they know that you know they're not going to be around in two years so they need to take advantage and you know as i said earlier these are the kind of people we try and go away from um the kind of next example is so this is a seven-year-old boy named ryan unfortunately that is where the similarities end he reviews toys and last year made 22 million pounds so um a slight difference in uh what we do um and bank balances but essentially you know he's a seven-year-old reviewing toys and this this is a real influencer so he has huge um sway within the industry um Obviously, his audience is relatively young, um, but any new toy that comes to the market, he will be asked to um, review. Um, and that's what he does quite well, is that he quite simply just sticks to reviewing toys. He knows what works well um, and sticks to that. And that's quite often the problem with, you know, the kind of celebrities is that they do know what works well, which is obviously, you know, playing football or something like that, but try and promote anything just to get a bit more money on the side. Um, so, I mean, that's where kind of influencers are at the moment. A kind of topic I breached on earlier briefly was it's that trust element. So a lot of what we do is based on Instagram. Um, so we run three basic campaigns. One will be general brand awareness. One will be a sales campaign. So there'll be a swipe up function or one will be on a kind of CPA basis where it's um, either you're downloading an app or you're signing up to something. And in order for these kind of campaigns to work and be as successful as possible, we need that trust from the influencer. As I mentioned earlier, no one has trust in celebrities because they know they're getting paid. Whereas influencers, yes, they appreciate they're getting paid, but obviously not at the same level. But it's also that they're trusting that the product they're promoting is something that they actually do believe in and they would use. Um, the sale is therefore achieved through the persuasion of the call to action. This is quite often that swipe up function on Instagram. Um, and then obviously you can't have the persuasion unless the trust is there. So all of those kind of three facts need to be there in order to run a kind of successful influencer campaign. And then obviously what we're meant to be talking about, I thought I'd just give a background so you actually understand what influencer marketing is first. But so what is growth hacking? Um, essentially it's a term coined by, by Sean Ellis back in 2010. Describing how brands use innovative strategies to attract the maximum number of customers while spending as little as possible. I mean, obviously, that sounds fairly basic and what I presume every, any sensible company would do. But how is this related to influencer marketing and how has this been achieved in influencer marketing? So, I mean... I actually just put this in because I found it quite amusing, but a growth hacker is a person whose true north is growth. I'm not quite sure what that statement means and neither does he, but you know, it kind of shows what he thinks about his kind of views. And, you know, in a sense, he would be an influencer because, you know, he believes and quite a lot of his audience will believe he has a number of books um, that that's what it means. Um, and there's just a bit of background on Sean that he, you know, it's, a, as I said, growth hacking is a term to describe the sustainable growth approach used by the hyper growth companies like Facebook, Airbnb and Amazon. Um, a couple of other examples of growth hacking are so protein world um protein world um two years ago um started putting up these posters on the tube um and as you can imagine from the article on the right they got quite bad press however the social conversation you know that phrase that uh, any publicity is good publicity did actually work in this case um and obviously they're not looking to target 
um, the market that was kind of coming back to them uh, in terms of the kind of feminists that were defacing and shaming the ads, they were quite simply just trying to get as much coverage as possible, which worked extremely well for them. The brand's kind of grown year on year um, and is now actually at one of the, the one of the kind of forefronts in terms of the kind of supplement industry. But this was a great way of kicking it off. Um, and quite often in when we speak to clients, if they're looking to achieve growth, we need to kind of go outside of the box. Obviously, we don't tend to promote uh, campaigns like this. It's slightly risky. But um, in terms of doing something that will kind of shock uh, the industry. So one you might have seen recently. Um, so the guy on the left is actually dressed up. He is a 28-year-old male, uh, although he looks like a granddad. It's actually because he's banned from every sporting event. Uh, but he runs a website called Vitaly Uncensored, um, and he got his girlfriend to streak, basically, at the Champions League final. Um, she gained over a million followers within the few hours. She actually went to jail for a bit, but actually got released. Um, but it's this kind of stunt, um, and according, obviously, to Apex Group, um, this gained around 3.7 million in marketing. So just a kind of small stunt like this, kind of really shows how influencers are kind of thinking outside the box and was able to get him another 2, 000, 2 million users overnight. So a kind of real great way, cheap way, to um, obviously increase your following. And, um, another one is Pretty Little Things. So the reason I put this one up there is I was actually approached by one of their competitors and they wondered how Pretty Little Thing had managed to grow their following by over 100,000 in the period of three weeks. So a lot of what we do, as I said, is data-driven. So we will check all of the influencers that we use in order to make sure they haven't bought their following so that all of their following is authentic, uh, which obviously means that when clients are coming to us, we can recommend the right influencers in terms of who's going to be, get you know, the best bang for your buck in terms of who's actually going to, you know, be engaged with the post. So we did a bit of digging into Pretty Little Thing and actually transpires that the reason they were able to get um, those 100,000 followers was because they started running a campaign where you could win £40,000. Um, and all you had to do was tag three friends. So it was a great way of kind of increasing their following on the cheap. I think one of those, even you never really know whether someone wins that 40,000 or it's someone very close to the business, but obviously a great tool in order to increase their following. They also work with quite a lot of celebrities as well, which, uh, which might play a part in that, but the main one was obviously the 40K giveaway. Um, another one, I mean, slightly controversial this is. Um, I'm not sure if any of you know who Logan Paul is, but he is a rather famous YouTuber. He unfortunately um, was in Japan and came across a dead, someone who committed suicide in the woods and actually kept it on one of his videos, um, which led it to go viral for all the wrong reasons. Um, the point being is that he actually turned this around. So quite a lot of influencers have clothing brands or work with brands that they have invested in and it obviously makes uh, quite a new revenue stream. So instead of him, he did quite a few public apologies, but what he actually then decided to do was take that fame and actually use it to have the first YouTube um, boxing fight. So this fight took place in August, um, in which they sold 15,000 tickets for Manchester, and people were paying £7.50 on YouTube to watch the fight, and you couldn't watch it anywhere else. You know, this is something that had never been done before, and I think the purse they split between them was over 18 million. So you can really see the kind of power influencers have over the, over the market. The last one is really just to kind of highlight another brand um, that doesn't do it particularly well. So Daniel Wellington um, are a watch brand. Um, they've been going for a few years. Um, but what they started to do was actually use quite a lot of influencers at the start. Um, weren't growing quickly enough, so they actually then started using celebrities. So Kylie Jenner's promoted for them, and so is Kendall. But if you look at actually the um, engagement rates, I mean, they're particularly poor at kind of 4.5% and even 1.5% at the top. And this is really because, as I said earlier, celebrities don't have that influence over their audience. People know they're quite simply getting paid to do this. And 
you know, quite simply taking a photo of your wrists and going, this is my discount code, is not going to get anyone to buy anything. You know, you're not explaining the benefits of anything. And if you look at one of their recent posts, so, you know, with 4.6 million followers, they're getting 17,000 likes, um, which, as you can tell, it obviously means that their audience are not particularly engaged. And one would imagine that the reason they have that many followers is down to the fact they were using celebrities at the beginning. Um, so, I mean, I think this kind of comes to the end. I mean, this is really just trying to show you um, kind of how influencer marketing uh, has evolved, the reasons, well, the kind of pros and cons of using uh, influencers and that kind of steering away from using celebrities, but also how growth hacking has been used in, uh, in influencer marketing. So thanks very much.